uh, thanks for that, and uh, that helps us save a little bit of time. And there's really not enough time to talk about this topic, right? So, <clears throat> so um, we're the first panel, so uh, please be kind. Uh, if you do want to uh, post any questions, I can see them right here, and I can work them into the questions that the panel has agreed to. Um, so since the introductions are already done, I'll set a little bit of this, the stage. So uh, it, you just need to look at the, the newspapers, right? Disasters are increasing with great frequency and severity. Um, you know, Florida was just impacted by Hurricane Ian. It's projected to be, what, nearly a $70 billion disaster. Um, just last year, the, the total disaster global cost were $224 billion. Um, and as we look to the future, by 2050, you know, McKinsey did a study <clears throat> that getting to net zero will cost $3.5 trillion. And so there's the, the question I think that we're going to be confronting today, is that an opportunity? Is that a challenge? It's probably a little bit of both. At the same time, in that same timeline, it's estimated that $5.6 trillion will be the total disaster cost. So we're talking some natural tension between sustainability and, and resilience. So I wanted to ask this panel just to kind of get started. Sustainability or resilience? If you had to pick one, why? I, I can start. Uh, well, thanks, Rob, and thanks, uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. It's great to be here in person, you know, where we don't have to figure out the mute and unmute buttons and everything. Um, it's, a, it's a great, great question, and uh, if we think of sustainability with a much narrower lens when we um, think of it as more environmental sustainability, then resilience starts becoming almost a parallel and just an effort to it. But if we step back and I think open the aperture to say sustainability is really at the level of you know, human race, and then we almost tie that to some higher level objectives, like we all want health, wealth, and harmony right, at, at a global level, then uh, sustainability becomes, I think, that overarching you know, uh, phenomena where within that, now we have to think around, yes, the environmental aspects, yes, the resiliency, the adaptability that's required there, but also, interestingly, um, other things like safety and uh, you know, reliability of the built environment. And unless we look at, I think, all those different levers, we almost can't find those optimal pathways. So I'm a big believer in sort of that you know, systems level thinking to see what all of those different levers are and how can we have optimal pathways that balance those. So I'll probably you know, okay. start with that and you know, hand it over Chris, to you. That's a wonderful uh, response. And I'm a dad to a five-year-old, so often when we're talking about these terms, I, I try to figure out how do I get it so that she understands it. Mm -hmm. And what I often talk about for sustainability is how um, sustainability is how we can reduce the negative impacts that we have on the world at a high level, right? It's about finding balance and harmony with nature and people so that we can thrive in peace with one another. And it's about being resourceful. Um, you know, the, the concept of earth overshoot, I think, is a really visceral uh, concept for me to understand that, that imbalance that we're facing and the need for us to get back to, to that harmony, right? When I talk about resilience to my daughter, it's how do we minimize the negative impacts that the world has on us, right? At that point, it's really about being, uh, building the adaptive capacity for an institution, for a community to be able to prepare for, first of all, respond to, and then recover from uh, these shocks and stressors that we're facing, right? And, and being uh, m more forward thinking in that respect. And so I often see these two as one and the same, uh, and they're, they're both critically important to be uh, successful in any given silo. Uh, I'm coming, by the way, from about 10 years on the ground in the city of Orlando, Florida, where I served as the sustainability and resilience officer and built an office around both of these really important topics because, in my opinion, we can't necessarily solve one without the other. Well, great. Um, hello, everyone. I'm also very pleased and excited to be here in person. Um, traveled in from Southern California, so Welcome. weather here is lovely right now. <laughs> um, one thing I'll kind of maybe take the perspective of a business side. You know, at Esri, I'm curious how many people in the audience know of Esri. 
Oh, nice show of hands. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're that kind of continuing balance between, you know, um, a big part of our business, um, we're privately owned and operated, founded in 1969. We've been digitizing the planet. Uh, for over 50 years, we work in 160 countries across the globe. But we've, in this context of monitoring the globe, migration of populations, where, where water, water is too much and where water is too little, uh, air quality is everything that our former speaker talked about. But from my role in the company is to work with our private sector. And these businesses, I think the, the challenge, and I think you talked a little bit about it, mm -hmm. the, the tug and pull is that um, they have to be measured and measuring themselves on their short-term goals and accomplishments. Sometimes it's year over year, but often even now with our markets, it's quarter over quarter. And how do you maintain long-term resilience strategies when you're facing continuous immediate goals financially and otherwise? So I think that's always going to be the challenge. I think a lot of the businesses we work with, they're able to monetize the value back to the company long-term when they talk about resilience. We need to make sure we have palm oil sources 10 years from now. We need to make sure we can get um, cotton five years from now so they can monetize continuing to be in business through a resilience lens but it ultimately serves a sustainability purpose right, mm. right. And so, i think um, you know also just like you were looking at those uh, changing time horizons near yeah. term and long term i do think that to your point like chris because we have to act to the external threats right now and build the resilience for that mm -hmm. perhaps resilience is a more easily understood Exactly. Yeah, no phenomena, right? And sustainability by definition, and especially if you think of it from a multi-generational aspect, mm -hmm. it requires us to think really long term. And I don't know if human brain, you know, the collective brain is really... Seven generations, you know, right? Yeah, it's, to comprehend it's that. And uh, because of that, then, you know, we really have to think of sustainability as that long term horizon. Right. And perhaps those are some of the barriers, you know, why it, it may not take roots in society and, and communities in general very quickly. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing from all of you is that instead of uh, necessarily uh, parallel tracks headed towards the same direction, it's, it's almost like a roller coaster, like a corkscrew <laughs> roller coaster. It's graded, right? It, it, like it's a DNA. Like Intertwinedness, exactly. yes, Intertwined. I would agree. Uh, so the pandemic has really forced us to look at global fragility. Uh, and, and take a look at supply chains in all sorts of different ways, uh, take a look at our own health, our own health of our employees, health of our companies. Um, as we're looking across the globe and the intersection of resilience and sustainability, what, um, what examples have you seen or what are some of the immediate tangible efforts? You know, is it, is it, is it about standards? Is it about research? Um, what, are, what are some of the takeaways coming out of the pandemic related to um, sustainability and resilience. I, I can share a okay. quick thought. Um, and I think it really goes back to, again, that near term, long term, because pandemic allowed us to really think of near term. It's here now. The effects are being felt, right? And instead of maybe thinking as a parallel track, I'm going to go back on you know what I said and, and sort of think of resilience and sustainability as one thing that can feed another. So meaning near term, if we are able to do the resilience planning, now we have the mental uh, bandwidth as well as the time, energy, resources to think around that long-term sustainability and do that planning, right? And if we are able to execute that sustainability plan really well, now it's a virtuous cycle and we almost have uh, lesser and lesser need for very reactive resilience because that's more built in. That's how I see that interchange. And uh, one great example I was reading the other day is like Stockholm's uh, Resilience Center. They do a lot of research around resilient thinking. And they talk about, you know, yes, I mean, you need the right forecasting tools and the right, um, you know, uh, citizen engagement, but the citizens really have to own this. It really has to be a dialogue between the localities and the residents of those uh, localities, right? And they, they have studies which show that without that, you know, and without spending enough time um, on that facilitation piece, the impacts are not long-lasting. Mm. So I thought I would share that quick uh, 
example. An example I'd like to share, I heard about it in context recently to a podcast. I'm a podcaster, uh, and I admit it. Um, <clears throat> was this concept of if we look back at the pandemic, look at how rapidly every community, state, government, you know, country reported on COVID cases, reported on number of vaccines. The world surged together to have a single point of reference on impact, trends, models, and this was all done because of a critical human crisis. We are in a similar crisis, maybe it has a slightly longer trajectory, but I think we learned from the pandemic the ability and rapidness in which organizations, communities, businesses, health providers, governments can all come together collectively and share status mm -hmm. and help mitigate and, and kind of turn back and reverse impact. You could put that parallel against um, sustainability almost exactly. But we're just failing right now to have that level of urgency. And I think that's what part of we're here today to accomplish. It was a collective of everyone on the planet all coming together. And I think we have that same opportunity to do that here. All hands on deck, you know, <laughs> essentially. The other thought that I had is around the fact that the pandemic for me really centered health in the triple bottom line. I think we all knew about the social, environmental, economic, but this pandemic, I think, really centered and made it real for people, mm -hmm. right? The impacts that we're having on the environment uh, are leading to these public health implications, which ultimately had global economic implications. And, and I think people started to see the inter, uh, you know, interconnectedness of that. Coming from energy, obviously, we're all thinking about energy now. We have this you know, war that's going on that's focused on energy. We have these inflationary issues because of the cost of energy going up. And at the Department of Energy, I think there's a real centering and focus around how, uh, you know, this is a national security strategy as much as it is a climate strategy for us. And, and the need for us to transition very quickly to 100% clean electricity, right, by 2035 is our ultimate goal. Uh, and, and to begin to decarbonize our transportation sector. These are things that uh, ultimately are now coming to the, to the surface as a, a real sustainability issue, but also a real resilience and security issue as well. Uh, and so, you know, our Secretary Jennifer Granholm continues to underscore the importance around why this move towards a sustainable energy future is one that's, uh, you know, cross-cutting and that hits both social, economic, and environmental implications for a resilient future. So, so would you say that uh, resilience in some respects helps build momentum towards sustainability? I, I, I've seen that happen, as, um, and I think those terms often get interchanged right. uh, and in maybe more sensitive uh, communities that, that aren't fully embracing of the need to urgently address the climate crisis. This aspect of resilience and just being able to, to bounce forward from any mm -hmm. given uh, issue or challenge, whether it's cyber or man-made or natural disaster, is something that um, cuts across politics from what I've seen. Uh, in Orlando, we decided to create a regional resilience collaborative instead of a, a climate compact, which, you know, in South Florida, they have a regional climate compact, and it's been incredibly successful. But we saw that in our community, uh, our elected leaders and the overall makeup really felt that resilience was more of a galvanizing force for us. And, of course, sustain as we've been talking about, these things are very much, uh, you know, part of, part of themselves. They're braided together. So, um, so in thinking about... Uh, moving forward on sustainability, um, certainly the recent focus on infrastructure here uh, domestically has been something um, that we've invested in. Certainly other countries have invested in um, infrastructure. Um, how do you balance that long and short term um, investment, particularly when it comes to infrastructure with sustainability in mind? Um. So, you know, when we think of, I think, the future of infrastructure, we kind of have to look at some existing recent trends because I feel like they have the seeds for the, you know, future and how we want to imagine it. So, you know, we have obviously the bipartisan infrastructure law, the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, acting as a huge catalyst to your point, Chris, right? Not just around electrification, but also a clean and just transition, mm -hmm. right? 
then we have the effects of pandemic to a point where there are these aspects of hybrid work and you know the whole narrative around the third place and that requires its own uh, IT and digital infrastructure and, and that ecosystem. And then finally, I see a huge significant amount of innovation going on within the transportation sector, whether not just electric vehicles, but also connected and autonomous vehicles, right? And uh, commercial space travel. I mean, the kind of future that uh, we were imagining, it feels like a piece of that has already arrived, right? So when you look at this landscape, I think there are um, two different things that uh, we have to manage very well. At least they are close to my heart, so I thought I would share. One is that we have to recognize there is a convergence between the physical and digital, right? Like the new digital native generation almost wants the, that digital digitization. Uh, people want things green, secure, digital. Um, and with that convergence comes, you know, some of the technologies that we've been working with, whether that's, you know, data, computing, not just from the point of view of cloud, but also the edge computing, because that has aspects around resilience. All of that, you know, becomes increasingly important. And uh, just to give a couple examples, um, we are a long-term mission partner. Booz Allen is a long-term partner for DOE's RPIE program. Mm. And uh, along with other energy tech research, we also help with advanced power electronics for transmission, right? So now yeah. you have the physical and digital going on again. Uh, we support Department of Transportation's Intelligent Transportation System um, Joint Program Office. Mm -hmm. There again, you know, it's that data exchange and physical going on. Mm -hmm. So I'm very passionate about, you know, understanding and managing this physical digital convergence. I think that's going to be hugely important. And one other quick thing, I have to sort of say it, uh, it's around lifestyle infrastructure. It's a, it's a term, I don't know if it's mainstream, hopefully it becomes mainstream. So, I, I learned about it right now. Right, I learned about it recently. And it, I mean, you know, it really refers to being very intentional about creating shared spaces where communities can come together. Place and I mean, it's right. urban design, it's the eco-design aspect, right? The built and the natural environment uh, together. And I think that has huge implications around not just the livability of that area, but, you know, you are containing the sprawl becomes especially important, like in Global South and other, you know, areas. You reduce the traffic, congestion, pollution. You are localizing supply chains. You are retaining the talent. And it almost starts, again, those virtuous cycles. So to me, thinking around physical and digital, and then the lifestyle infrastructure, I think those are some you know, uh, aspects that we have to manage. I think the challenge that we're facing is this you know, need to think long term, but act immediate, mm -hmm. right? Act yesterday. Uh, and, and I think the Department of Energy is a prime example of, of how we're trying to find this balance. Historically, the, we just celebrated the 45th anniversary of DOE last week. The, the, the last 45 years has really been focused on the research development and, deploy, and, and demonstration of the long-term energy systems that will allow us to move from the energy that built our world to the energy that's going to shape our future, right? We're moving, we're decarbonizing, we're moving towards this digital and connected energy system that's decentralized, that's digitized, that's decarbonized. Um, at the same time, because of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act and Chips and Science Act and the Defense Protection Act, these four major acts that have been passed in less than one year, 2022, okay, have been um, kind of the perfect storm for climate action, quite frankly. Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, between that and IRA, has provided about $100 billion to the U.S. Department of Energy. Very quickly, our secretary, Granholm, realized DOE has never been set up to be a deployment agency. We've been a research and development agency at the national labs with our 17 labs, right, commercializing these technologies. And now, all of a sudden, we have $100 billion to do the work. And she realized that we're not set up to do that. So we created a new pillar of the Department of Energy on, focused on deployment. It's called the Office of Infrastructure. There's a whole new undersecretary now at the department. There are eight program offices that are being created. And I accepted an appointment this summer to come and help create one of these new offices. And it's called State and Community Energy Programs. Uh, and it's focused on place-based energy systems, getting 
down to the community. Too often, we've, we've been working at higher levels, and we need to work at the city, county, school districts, nonprofits, labor union level. And so um, in addition to this new office around state and communities, there's also the manufacturing and supply chains office, trying to build resilient supply chains and domestic manufacturing. There's the grid deployment office, GDO, to deploy the next generation of transmission and distribution grids, right? We need to almost double the amount of electric grid that we have today in the next 30 years in order to withstand the EVs and all the integration of clean energy. And then lastly, there's what's called the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. And it's really focused on taking what's been in the lab and tested and now deploy at scale, right? And, and that's things like the hydrogen hubs FOA that came out during the Global Clean Energy Action Forum. That's a big deal, building 10 hydrogen hubs across the country. Um, also things around small modular reactors and others. So, so you have this now um, structure at the department that's both looking long term at our national labs uh, as well as now beginning to deploy literally hundreds of billions of dollars in, in resources to, to catalyze this clean energy transition. That's a great, great segue. I think you did it naturally here. <laughs> We're going to go from the very big to yeah. the, the, the deployment to now how do you actualize that. And I think um, one thing that I'd say is that <clears throat> there, the government, all the groups here know that the information, the intelligence that we need is all out there today, we were, we were talking about how much we are quadrupling information across the globe. One thing that um, we've seen the White House do, and they rolled it out um, on September 8th in collaboration with Esri, fortunately, is taking an understanding of these bodies of laws that have come into um, effect this year, in less than 12 months, they affect um, infrastructure and the communities and public health and education and the White House understood how necessary it was, having seen you know, previous bills in previous administrations not get to the right level mm. of the people in the community and into the infrastructure. So they rolled out um, a product in September called the White House Climate Mapping Portal. Mm. And that took the ability for any community at a block group level, at a zip code level, county, state, whatever it might be, and to understand any potential request for funding, um, tax mm -hmm. incentives, and apply them. Is, it, is this the right place to put a school? Is this the right place to put a water treatment? And they were able to immediately respond to grant opportunities and funding opportunities to say, I know exactly based on current climate models what this is going to do to help or hurt my community and, and the businesses that I serve. So it's this ability to take this very important investment hmm. that, that our government is making um, with our taxpayer dollars today and making sure that it's rolling into the hands and into the communities that can have the highest benefit from it and make sure that it doesn't get stalled or you know allocated to the wrong channels and i think it's this actionability is that a word hmm. actionability <laughs> of what we're going through right now it is i think the first i've seen it as an adult and in, mm -hmm. in the work that we're doing so long term outcomes expected, but with short-term action. I think that's what really is important now. I, I think we also need to underscore, uh, and you were alluding to it, the Justice 40 uh, yeah. focus mm -hmm. and the centering across the entire U.S. government, right? Building this executive equity. order yeah. and mm -hmm. building equity and focusing it on getting to disadvantaged communities is the key, you know, basically essence of what we're trying to do here. It's not just a clean energy transition. It is a just and equitable transition to, a, to clean energy. Um, what we're saying at the department is 40% is the floor, right? We're hoping that 60% minimum of the funds that are being deployed through the Department of Energy are, are touching communities of concern and disadvantaged communities. So it's, it's really exciting because we don't have just the funding, but we also have the, the overall morality that we need to focus on those that need it most. And if we can solve for them, perhaps maybe we can solve for everyone. So uh, we are getting questions in, so thanks uh, for sharing those. I'm going to start working those into the, uh, to the questions. One of the first ones, and I'll just build from what we were just talking about, the actionability. You know, there's, there's a sense of urgency that really does need to get created, both around, I think, resilience and sustainability. So the question is, how do we create more urgency in business and government uh, to work together to advance sustainability in local and global communities? How do you create that sense of urgency? Maybe it's data, maybe it's the sense making that Esri, Esri and others like it uh, provides. Maybe it's the use of data. What, yeah, what are I mean, some uh, thoughts around that? 
look, I mean, I, I'm a you know, technology and innovation person uh, as my primary persona. So uh, thinking around that, to your point, uh, Rob, I mean, I'll give one example where um, as part of some of our work with Air Force, for example, we uh, did a digital twin of one of the bases, right? And for those of you who might not know the details, uh, a twin is really a digital representation. It could be of any physical structure, could be an airport, a building, entire cities, could be the Earth if you, you know, feed enough Earth observation data to it. Mm -hmm. And apart from just that visualization, what that allowed, uh, you know, that base to do is really build different scenarios and simulations to say, well, what might be the impact if level four, level five hurricane hit that, right? And then how do you use that to do your resiliency planning and then you know, change whatever is needed um, at that base? Now, that's a great example. What's more interesting or equally interesting to me is that that's a very replicable, you know, it's, we can replicate that model, the underlying technology, the design patterns very easily, right? So in my mind, Yes, there is a sense of urgency that's perhaps already there, but along with that, what's needed is to look at what is cross-applicable and then be able to you know, apply that in other parts of the country, of the globe, very easily. I'd say it's, it's about um, empowering communities uh, to engage and, and get further involved. When, in my role in Orlando, um, a lot of the policies that we were able to pass um, were because of, quite frankly, the pressure that we were getting from our communities about the need to address things like energy burden or the need to address things like gaps of EV charging infrastructure in low-income communities. And, and that level of pressure uh, essentially allowed the government to set clear direction, whether it's goals and frameworks, um, that ultimately the private sector was able to build business models around. Uh, and I think we're seeing that in a number of different ways in the EV space, right? You have companies like EVGo and Tesla and the, and the like, and they're developing these public-private partnerships where, you know, communities are providing, you know, space and, and parking locations, and they're coming in and landing the infrastructure to fill that gap. Uh, and, and so you have clear direction and, and bold, you know, ambitious goals from the government set out to move us towards a decarbonized zero economy. And at the same time, you have new business models being fostered, new entrepreneurship principles being fostered. It all came back, though, from communities being educated and empowered to get engaged civically and even put pressure on the companies that they want to support, right, that they want to foster and, and that they want to do business with and be a patron of. So I think it comes back to the consumer and, and that ultimately we all have a really important power to put pressure on governments and businesses to prioritize this and to drive the urgency. Definitely want to build on that. Absolutely. A fact is, in supply chain, not the transportation of goods, but the actual origin and sourcing of material can be up to 90% of scope 3 GHG, right? So when we think about um, the shoes we're wearing, the car we're buying, the um, home goods that we're purchasing on the weekend um, and all the containers out in our oceans. Um, those are all the goods that are manufactured globally and we are an interconnected global ecosystem. We can't just shut down and we're not going to buy anything from overseas anymore. But it's like how do we go and find and understand as a consumer and as a business um, once we get past what we refer to as tier one or tier two in supply chain, it starts to get fuzzy to dark, right? So I, I was introduced to a, a, an expression the other day. Um, I'm on the Sustainable Apparel Coalition board, and so I work very closely with a lot of global brands um, and their supply network. And there's something that, um, you know, copyright James Schaefer, um, the dark chain, right? It doesn't mean that it's, a, a to all, it's all toxic and dirty, but brands can't go beyond one or two levels of understanding of where their goods are sourced and how are they working their way across our globe. And so when we think about all of these things, consumers need to lean in, our brands need to lean in, our governments need to put a, you talk about urgency, you know, they need to put a cost of not understanding where you're sourcing 
because that sourcing isn't just will cotton or palm oil continue to be available, but who's the labor force that's bringing that product all the way through the ecosystem? And if we aren't investing in that understanding and, and making sure we're supporting the communities that we're sourcing from, we can't, we can't actually realize the full gains that we want here in the United States. Mm -hmm. so. Soapbox, I'll put it away now, but. <laughs> and just to close the loop, I know, Chris, you talked about communities. Uh, you know, Cindy, you talked about sort of the consumer and brand aspect. I also think that um, apart from mobilization within those spaces, we need the private sector mobilization right now, right? And it's not even so much of a just, hey, the, the sustainability equation and, and take a look at that. It's really an opportunity for economic growth in some sense. And if you think of some core, let's say, invention, whether electric vehicles or whatever, to be able to make that affordable, right? To back to your point around Justice 40 and other programs, you need almost an additional innovation ecosystem around that so that now you are able to offer that asset, whatever it is, at different price points, right? You need yet another innovation ecosystem to say, uh, how can we remove some barriers um, to adoption of some of these newer technologies or whatever, right? So all that together, I mean, that's a great opportunity, you know, for the innovators and entrepreneurs of the world to step up and, uh, and be part of this movement. As we often say, this, this transition is the greatest economic and job creation opportunity of mm -hmm. the 21st century. And, and, and we're starting to see um, the investment community also begin making bold commitments, $130 trillion mm -hmm. committed uh, to ESG and sustainability by the year 2030. I mean, this is a huge amount of, of capital, and it's about, you know, now we're, now we're starting to see the alignments of, of the government urgency, of the private sector, and the investment community, and what, what citizens want, ultimately, in, in, in cleaner, healthier, safer uh, solutions. I'll just close this question out with one thing. <laughs> and one thing, too, um, I so applaud companies that are standing up their Office of Sustainability, their Chief Sustainability Officer, VP of Sustainability. Sustainability needs to be like accountability across the entire organization. It needs to be pervasive. You know, when we're doing a marketing campaign, when we're doing product development and design, we're doing sourcing, mm -hmm. we're doing um, professional development for our sales team, sustainability and resilience should be evident in right. everything that we do. It should be across the value chain, not, a, I, again, I heard a reference, not a box in the back of the truck mm -hmm. that occasionally you take it off, show it off to everybody, and then you put it back. It should be pervasive. We've got to go from being, um, just being concerned about reporting on ESG to infusing sustainable thinking and responsible business across the enterprise. Anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So uh, just thinking about making it uh, real, we have a couple questions. One is uh, related to, you know, how do we really get both public and private sectors to work together in the community to achieve some of these um, objectives? What are some thoughts around that? And Chris, maybe, maybe you are, are, are probably best, best attuned to answer. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think um, all of these resources that we've been talking about, Bill and Ira and, you know, all of these various different acts and laws that have passed, um, you know, ultimately, these are huge sums of money, right? But at, at the end of the day, they're, they're a down payment into the actual investment we need to make this transition. Uh, as an example, my office will oversee a new funding provision that will come out early next year around public schools. Public school funding for the first time ever in the Department of Energy to support the neediest schools with modernizing, upgrading their facilities, lowering energy costs, improving public health, etc. It's $500 million. That sounds huge. But there's $32 billion in deferred maintenance in this country right now in public schools. It's a drop in the bucket. So what we're trying to do is fund proposals that are trying to say, hmm, how might we leverage the small amount that we might get, maybe on average $200,000 grant, how might we leverage that to actually scale to a $20 million bond that helps us to actually do an energy saving performance contract across all of our public school buildings in that community? Right now, we're taking uh, a down payment of that grant, maybe matching it with some of the capital improvement dollars that they might have from an additional bond, and the private sector coming in to de-risk that investment and to drive forward uh, that sustainability. And so, I think those are examples that we're hoping to see the leverage. You know, the secretary continues to say we need to get creative about leveraging these resources because they sound big, but they're really just the down payment to get us towards this transition. 
So I'll share an example, again, from the business sector. Sorry if I'm going too far in the private sector over and over again. <laughs> no, no, this is good. Uh, we work with AT&T, and AT&T, as, as we can all imagine globally, we think of the convenience of our phone, convenience of our you know, cell phones, convenience of getting the internet, but it's a you know, kind of a life-saving emergency response channel of communication. Hmm. So AT&T takes very seriously their service level agreements with every consumer, every business they work with, every public um, safety organization they work with. So they recently did, um, in collaboration with Argonne National Labs, you've got AT&T, Argonne National Labs, and said, where is our infrastructure today? Where are not only our towers, but where are, where are our data centers? I say this because they're usually underground or, or very well. <laughs> and they're, they're cooled somewhere um, with a lot of energy. Um, but they looked at their entire global infrastructure footprint and how were they being able to serve. And they could take with Argonne's work and say, where are we at risk two years from now, five years from now, and 10 years from now, all modeling where are we at risk of being underwater? Florida was a lot of places where they risked being underwater. And so they were able to be very prescriptive in reassessing their infrastructure and where they were, where they needed to be. But it was all with the premise of better serving and being sure they were up and available in times of crisis. And then what they do, you know, then that leans into that whole industry. Okay, well, they're going to get more customers. They're going to get more people who can depend on AT&T, including the you know, public safety uh, organizations. And then the next telecommunications follows. And I feel like we need those spearheads that are out there saying, we're, we're doing this for resilience purposes. We're going to be more sustainable, but ultimately we're gonna make sure we serve our community um, equitably and uh, with talent. They're also hiring, I, mean, I think everybody's hiring. But I think that's the two things that go and find this urgent business need and partner with the research, the science, and the, and the technologies that bring it forward today. So that, that would be my example. So with that kind of uncertainty, but also knowing that, um, you know, for example, communities right now are literally cleaning up in, yeah. in Florida, but also in Pakistan and other places, um, there is repetitive loss, right? And so that creates maybe some opportunity about making investments. And then also, if you think about, um, you know, was it last winter? A uh, significant part of Texas mm -hmm. uh, was with, without power for some time as well. So, you know, making this a little bit more real, what what kind of what kind of investments would you think about for that local context to build resilience, but also advance uh, sustainability? Actually, I have a great example of what we did in Orlando that happened to work really well during this last storm in Ian. And, and um, prior to coming here, one of the projects I was super excited about are what's called resilience hubs. And the, the idea is that not every single person, especially our low income, have the ability of getting a backup generator for their home when the grid goes down and therefore having, you know, quality of life. Um, and, and so we identified uh, a HUD grant that was intending to help improve community centers. And we obviously have a goal to decarbonize our entire city. And so we were thinking already, how might we add rooftop solar and improve the efficiency of these facilities and with this grant, we were able to incorporate many features that also turned it into these resilience hubs when the grid went down and when we hit a storm. And that included not just rooftop solar, but dedicated battery backup, enhanced filtration in the HVAC system, right? MERV 13 filters and bipolar ionization, it's called. We, we then had uh, created a food pantry. We had uh, an ice storage, water filtration, EV charging, community garden, uh, in redundant communication systems, and these were located in disadvantaged communities. The idea is that a community could walk to this center and be able to get critical resources in times of need and be connected to an actual emergency shelter if they needed to, to, to be placed somewhere overnight. Um, and so we started out with six of these. They're now growing to 10 of these resilience hubs. But during this past storm, and in addition to kind of your brick and mortar community center, we also were placing these off-grid, solar-powered kind of picnic tables that also had Wi-Fi capabilities. Ten Wi-Fi devices could be connected, had battery storage, had lighting. And so in, if you weren't next to, you know, in walking distance to a center, you can at least get critical load charged or communicated. Uh, and those are being popped up throughout the community. So I think we need to, to think about these abilities of, of tying sustainability features with the ability of resilience when, when, when it's needed.
And just to practice, you talked about edge computing earlier. The fact that every single one of us is an edge computer today, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's shelter in place uh, um, forms that they filled out during IRA and, and all the others that the shelter in place, our phones and, and things become very essential because now you're understanding mass of where people are. Mm -hmm. who, who came out, who's now declared they're, they're fine and who's still missing and allowed uh, that public safety group, as you mentioned, going house to house and knowing mm -hmm. which house is most likely mm -hmm. needed, needed support. support. So that whole pervasiveness of uh, connectivity, yep. that digital mm -hmm. twin of our uh, kind of storm mm -hmm. was a huge uplift, I think. And now we just yeah. need to make sure that the systems are redundant so that we can communicate sure. when yes. they're down. Exactly, right? and, exactly. Yeah. And Rob, I think what you mentioned, I think you used the term local context or something. I think that's really important. I mean, as someone who grew up in a South Asian country, I certainly appreciate the differences between different countries in terms of what's available, what's on the ground, right? And it varies. Um, everything from the capital that's available, the government, its advocacy, its uh, the kind of core infrastructure and technology, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to be very cognizant of that. And I mean, um, I'll give an example, you know, Booz Allen, for example, worked very closely with FEMA around Hurricane Ian, around just looking at uh, the US videos and then analyzing them and constructing and then helping the search and rescue efforts, right? I think they even supported the uh, back-end website, which is, I believe, ESRI-based. So all of that is obviously, you know, disaster response and reactionary. Um, when we switch that narrative from reactionary to a little bit more proactive, um, around that, you know, there are certain programs that are already doing work in the adjacent areas that I believe can be very well leveraged. And I'll, I'll give an example because I find it very inspiring. Uh, there is a partnership between NGA and the Department of State for what's called Worldwide Human Geography Working Group. And I'm like, human geography, that's essentially uh, data around physical places and how they evolve in space and time and what's the impact of that on people and cultures and behaviors. Right now, you traditionally would not have thought of applying that to the climate resilience and sustainability piece, but that's exactly what's happening right now. They are using those data sets uh, for emergency planning, for, and of course for research and policy development and things like that. And it's a great collaboration where, uh, to your question earlier around you know, cross-sectoral collaboration, it has some 1,700 organizations around the globe, uh, 150 countries participating, some 5,000 something data sets. Any one of you can be part of that working group, right? And being able to pull those resources, whether that's data, whether that's you know, the innovations that are happening in one part, and being able to replicate that, I feel like you know, that's the need of the future. So we are almost, uh, almost done, and I've got uh, <laughs> quite a few questions. So um, I'm gonna bundle, I think, one last question. You know, I started asking out you know, resilience uh, or sustainability. I think it's resilience and sustainability, right? Um, but what, what is some actionable advice? You know, it's long-term goals. Data can help build uh, more certainty around your, your decision-making. Technology is certainly an enabler. You need government and the private sector working together. So just, just really kind of want to close the call to action. You know, what's really the next step uh, from, your from your, each of your unique perspectives? Yeah, let's start Again. from there. And start from yeah. there. So I, I want to echo back on, I think a lot of what we said is this concept of transparency, right? And I think the next action and continuous action, sustainability isn't one goal out there, right? It's going to continue to evolve mm -hmm. and, and, and broaden. A journey, not a destination. It's a, it's a journey, right? it's a marathon, not a, not a sprint. And I think um, transparency and you know, asking of our policymakers about the businesses that we work with, you know, um, to be transparent, I think through that lens of of end to end transparency, a lot of what we can do right now will be revealed to us, and I think we should be demanding it. But going back, it's it's a consumer perspective. But I'm I'm a consumer when I work too, and so I want to take that into my workplace every day. I'd say take advice from nature and and drive partnerships and collaboration. Right biodiversity, the more diverse an ecosystem, the more flows of energy, the more resilient that ecosystem is. Uh, we need to um, think about our communities as these ecosystems 
and, and begin to assemble the partnerships and the collaborations that will allow you to be successful, not in the short term, but in the long term. I'll tell you a lot of the funding that, that my office, my office has about $6 billion worth of competitive and formula grants going to cities, counties, school districts, nonprofits, labor unions, down to the community level and states and tribes, of course, as well. Um, but in addition, there's $10 billion worth of rebates, the consumer rebates you hear about, the home electrification, the whole home performance, the, the training provisions that support those, the building code adoptions. These are things that my office are going to facilitate. And embedded within all of these proposals is trying to force the partnerships to sustain these efforts beyond just the flash of Bill and IRA and CHIPS Act, right? And so build those connections, um, develop federal funding workshops, try to think and pull people together to think about ways in which we can co-apply to this funding, and I think overall you'll, you'll be more successful in that way. I'll say two quick things. Uh, one, I go back to the optimal pathway discussion that we had, like how do we meaningfully and intentionally figure out the balance between sustainability, um, the safety, affordability, resilience, right? What is the right equation around that? Um, the second thing I would say is that, yes, technology, innovation, these are great enablers. You use the term enabler. Uh, but technology alone is not sufficient, right? And even there, back to your point, there is a, a need to open the aperture so that it's not very siloed and, you know, within an enterprise, but it really moves from that siloed view into more open, uh, more ecosystem level, you know, technology implementations. Well, thank you, Cindy, Chris, and Prachi for your time. And uh, thanks a lot for your patience. Hopefully we got to all the questions. <laughs> Tried my best to manage to- We'll be around. <laughs> loop some together. So thanks very much. I'm well done. Thank you.